regardless of where we fall in these conversations, whether we're glasses half full people or glasses half empty people, regardless of when we see the crisis starting, I think we can more or less agree on when things started to boil over. Now, there are a lot of contributing factors to January 6th. Um, we can talk about frustration with COVID lockdowns. We can talk about social media and the way that people absorb information, information shifting in such a way that people lost their sense of fact and fiction and how to draw those distinctions. We can talk about the spread of conspiracy theories, such as QAnon or very systematically, um, very systematically promulgated stories about a rigged election that people accepted as fact. We can talk about the coordinated efforts of militant groups such as the Oath Keepers or the Proud Boys. But one of the things that struck me as a scholar of religion was the sheer amount of religious imagery and language connected to the event. And if you look at photos from that day, you'll start to pick up on that imagery. Now the imagery really sits uneasily with the other imagery of that day. The flags, the Trump memorabilia, the weapons and riot shields, or in this case, the loaded symbol of a Bible being held in skeleton hands. Most of the symbolism was very clearly Christian. And despite our cultural insistence on church-state separation, it was unapologetically political. One of the reasons why I wanted to show this particular image is that it evokes something of the tradition of religious procession. What are they processing to? Why are they processing? is a question we're sitting with. This is just an example of some of the merchandise available for that day. And for many of the participants, there was, they saw no need to distinguish their faith commitments from allegiance to a particular figure who sought to overthrow the results of a democratic election. So what exactly did these religiously inspired figures who were at the January 6th riots want? An image like this one suggests some kind of fusion of theocracy and Trumpism. And this is the kind of image, by the way, that if this were a live classroom, I would ask my students to interpret. So let's go ahead, I'll just take a quick minute and get your impressions of this image. What does it tell you? How are you inclined to interpret it? What jumps out at you? Oh, look at the flag and look at the cross. So the juxtaposition of flag and cross is very clear. And here we see the flag in a subordinated position to the cross. Okay, so this act of, if I can just interpret that a little bit, um, this act of extreme contrition on the part of this figure that's wrapped in a Trump flag, perhaps positioning Trump as a kind of martyr figure, as a kind of holy figure, um, and also somehow subordinated to this image of the cross. Go ahead. I'm also seeing someone who makes me think of like lords. People who are crawling to to get salvation, and with, with 
Trump sign on his back, he sees Trump as today's savior that Jesus was or is for some. But this person is just like something. He's on his knees and, and praying. being vocal about the passion for Trump and what he perceives as the savior of Trump. Okay, so a supplicant at a holy site. Right. right the example you gave was, was Lourdes, the God at Lourdes. Um, these sites that elicit this intense fervor and devotion, this kind of physical sacrifice. Um, and again, you know, positioning the figure of Trump as, as somebody who worthy of that kind of sacrifice and positioning this place as this intensely sacred site. Um, perhaps a miraculous site. Um, so thank you. Those were, those were wonderful um, observations on this, this image. Um, and all of those themes that you're picking up on I think are very much there. I think this is very much a part of the architecture of the day. Now, despite the clear theocratic overtones of this imagery, one of the interesting things about this movement is that it has this curiously ecumenical side as well. Right? It's a movement that crosses the bounds of language and culture. It draws from all these different pockets, mainly of Christianity. But you see people from across the spectrum of, of Christianity and even beyond represented as part of this, this theocratic coalition. It's a movement that fuses the traditional with the new age. So I'll, I will remind you in case you've forgotten, I hope for your sake that you have forgotten. This here is, uh, a, this is Jake Angeli, uh, also known as a QAnon shaman. Identifies as neo-pagan um, and fuses this ultra-nationalism with neo-paganism with some strikingly evangelical Christian language. And so where we see this come through, I just want us to play a clip of a prayer that he read. He'd gotten into the Senate, he was at the Senate dais, and spontaneously offers up this prayer. I want us to sit with that prayer for just a second. Audio quality is not great. We can only pick up snippets of words, but there's still a lot to interpret there in terms of their gestures and the words that you're able to pick out. So, 
again, what strikes you as particularly noteworthy about the religious character of that moment or the traditions that it's drawing from? So, yes, a revival tent type feel for sure. Um, we can position it very clearly in the charismatic wing of Christianity. And there's this branch of Christianity that basically believes that we can go back to the miracles and signs and wonders of the New Testament, that that's something that's available to us today. Um, and you can see, you know, in the raised hands, in the kind of ecstatic nature of the language, it's an attempt to conjure an atmosphere that allows those things to enter into the present, happening right on the floor of the Senate. Again, in a country that has an anti-establishment clause in its constitution. So you start to see all of these, these strains come together, these tensions come together, and then you have the image of a person who's dressed like a shaman giving a prayer that's drawing on this strikingly Christian idiom. Um, and what I would, please go ahead. You know, I looked at them horrified. They looked like, they looked like morons. Out of control, they were embarrassing. Um, has any church come out and defended them? So the question is, are there any churches that have defended this? The answer is yes. Absolutely yes. Um, and here's the thing. What looks chaotic to the outsider to the insider is really not. This is all part of, we can call it almost kind of a form of religious choreography, right? Um, the beats of that prayer for people who come out of charismatic traditions are very recognizable. Um, and I, so I will talk in a second about the religious movements that claim this and are still advancing it today. Um, and I want to spotlight one of these movements. It's called the New Apostolic Reformation. So just some quick data points on this movement. Sorry. The New Apostolic Reformation had its roots in charismatic and neo-Pentecostal movements in the 1970s and 1980s. And again, we can classif classify these movements. They're, they're distinct, but for our purposes, they both assert this idea that signs and wonders from the New Testament are available to us today. And they are also apocalyptic. They believe the second coming of Jesus Christ is right around the corner. And that part of their job is to help usher that in by taking control of governments and making them Christian. Um, so they believe that Christians have a responsibility to take over the seven mountains of society um, and they include some very high-profile people in our government among their members. Uh, somebody like House Speaker Mike Johnson or Lauren, Bur La Lauren Boebert or Trump advisor Paula White are all figures that are aligned with this movement. Um, and they're part of this process of really working on re-narrating January 6th, um, not as a riot or an insurrection, um, but really as an opening salvo on trying to reclaim America for Christ. Right? That is the language that these groups would be using. Now, this image I took from a site that is aligned with the New Apostolic Reformation, um, and it outlines you know, the seven mountains ideology. Right? What are the seven mountains of society that Christians are supposed to be in control of? Um, and the writing is a little bit blurry. But at the very top, right underneath the, the pinnacle of the mountain, it says the kingdom of our God. So that's striking for two reasons. First of all, the language of kingdom. This is not a democratic vision of government. Right. Um, the second piece of it that I want to draw our attention to is the language of our God. Um, because not only is this excluding other religious groups, it's also excluding a lot of other Christians, right? Any, any groups that are, you know, broadly liberal wings of Christianity 
you know, rings of Christianity that are, say, open and affirming, don't count as Christians. They're, they're apostates for groups like the New Apostolic Reformation. And part of why I bring up this Seven Mountain Mandate is that it's something that's growing in popularity more or less as we speak. So here we have, this is a poll taken by, um, you know, Paul, Paul Juppé is a sociologist. It's a pretty good sample size of people who self-identify as Christians. The sample's over 2,000 people. So the samples were taken from March 2023 and January 2024. So we're talking about nine months apart here. And in that nine months, we see a 10-point swing toward affirming the belief that Christians are supposed to take control of the seven mountains of society. So it tells us something about how quickly this movement is growing, and it tells us something about the organization behind it. Um, the New Apostolic Reformation is very coordinated um, in its efforts to get the word out and get people to adopt its view. So I want to make clear, because I don't, I don't want the numbers to be deceptive here, this is within the subset of people who affirm the Seven Mountain Mandate, but this is still worth paying attention to. Within that subset, over 50% believe that churches should have veto over legislation that the governments pass. Right, so this is a subordination of government to church. Yes, that's correct. Specifically, they are subset of it. Yes, that's correct. So they're subset of the Christian church. Um, and the second piece, we're talking about just a little over 40% um, argue that full citizenship should only be granted to Christians. Uh, full, full citizenship should only be granted to Christians. So affirm that in the positive. Um, so listen, I don't want to veer toward alarmism, okay? This is still... It's alarming, sorry. <laughs> it's still a subset. But I think it's a numerically significant subset with a lot of influence in American politics. And it's tapping into this broader lack of faith in democratic institutions, which is part of why... And it's what? Growing. And it is growing. It is, it is certainly growing. So these are all the reasons why I think this movement is worth our attention. Um, so here are the various pieces of the argument that I'll make over the um, remainder of our time together. The democracy in crisis bit, we, we've gone through that. We've finished with that. Um, and we've talked a bit about how the attacks on democracy are being justified on religious grounds. Um, and precisely for that reason, I think pushing back is going to require us to figure out religious defenses. And by religious defenses, I don't mean this has to be explicitly Christian. I think there are ways to do this in, a, um, in language that fits a pluralistic context, that casts a very wide net of people that can affirm it. But the religious component has to be a part of the story, or you're not going to convince people who are otherwise drawn to something like the New Apostolic Reformation. And finally, I want to make the case that any resistance from the World War II era can help us out in our particular moment. But first, I want to do just a quick retrospective. Um, we do funny things with the past. In our imagination, it's a much more solid, certain object um, than it, it was, in fact, when we dig into the history of the moment. Um, and in the American context, you know, the, the whole American experiment is stunning and improbable. We forget this sometimes. And the fact that we've managed to keep it this long is also quite amazing. And one of the things that have made the, Demo the American experiment so improbable is just the sheer diversity that has been there from the start. So this is just from the travelogues of Andrew Burnaby, who was a writer and 
uh, clergy person for the Church of England. Um, and it's just a stunning quote. Fire and water are not more heterogeneous than the different colonies of North America. He's writing this in 1760. So we're within 20 years of the start of the Revolutionary War. And you already have this traveler who's trying, he can sense the tensions in America, in the colonies at the time. He's trying not to take sides in his travelogues, but he's noting, okay, there are a lot of different camps here. This is a boisterous bunch. How are they going to make this work? So here we have this famous exchange between Elizabeth Willing Powell and Benjamin Franklin. Um, right as the, Demo the, the Constitutional Convention was concluding in 1787, she asked them, well, doctor, what have we got, a republic or a monarchy? And his response was, a republic if you can keep it. And like so many of Franklin's sayings, this has this kind of ominous ring to it. But he's onto something. Democracy takes work. It always has. And every generation in its own way has to figure out how to take up the mantle of that work. Just think of the challenges to democracy that this country has dealt with. Think about slavery and the Jim Crow era, or Japanese internment, or treaties made and violently broken with Native America. This foreshadows next week's lecture a little bit. Consider that women, half the population, only gained access to the ballot box 100 years ago. It really hasn't been that long. And part of what makes the current moment so disconcerting is that we have come off such a long stretch of broad consensus about the value of democracy, arguably the longest stretch we've ever had as a country, where we could fall back on that consensus. And so that's part of what makes this moment, I think, feel especially jarring. Because it's been so long. It's almost a couple of generations who don't have the memory of, well, certainly not the Civil War, but also the, um, the internment of the Japanese Americans. Yeah, and... Um, so the, the comment was about Japanese internment and who still has cultural memory of these things. Vanishingly few people have memory of the last time democracy was in crisis, right? So this would have been from the Great Depression to the conclusion of World War II. There's still some, but very few. And so that's also the, an issue that we're dealing with culturally, is who still has that memory, who can kind of give a steadying influence on the culture in general, right? And say, no, we, we've been through some difficult times before. Maybe we can make it through this as well. <clears throat> but our last big crisis was from roughly 1930 to 1945. These dates obviously index onto the start of the Great Depression and go until the end of World War II. And again, um, the way we tell the stories of the period we won World War II. We came out incredibly powerful and prosperous. So it's, it's easy to look at that era through rose-colored glasses. It was really uncertain and unstable. So just some kind of markers to help orient us in that time period. So obviously you have the Great Depression, and this very slow recovery um, toward the end of the 1930s, but very slow, not rapid enough. Still a lot of people in bread lines. Again, this is not a part of our cultural memory today. As bad as the 2008 recession was, um, we weren't dealing with bread lines in the same way. Right, with people struggling to get calories into their bodies. Right, that was the Great Depression. Um, we see the rise of America First isolationism, 
Um, so I will talk about this in a little bit more detail in a second. Um, the I, America First movement really hit its stride in the late 1930s, right around 1940. So this is on the cusp of the war, but the movement grew very rapidly. Right? Charles Lindbergh is a figure that we associate with it. And this wasn't some kind of innocuous movement either. Right? This was a movement that had fascist tendencies of its own and had a fascist agenda of its own. Um, again, because of America's role in helping to liberate concentration camps and end the Holocaust, we forget about our own struggles with anti-Semitism. Um, but anti-Semitism was rampant during this period as well. And finally, we had prominent religious voices galvanizing public opinion against democracy. Does any of this sound familiar? So perhaps the most prominent of these figures from the era is uh, Father Charles Coughlin. So he ran a radio show um, throughout the 1930s, um, was one of the main promulgators of conspiracy theories about Jewish people, along with Henry Ford, incidentally, through the Dearborn Independent, the Protocols of the, er of the uh, Elders of Zion. So you had these really prominent figures, and you know Henry Ford also positioning himself as a certain type of pious man, um, promulgating some of the worst anti-Semitic material on American soil. Um, but Coughlin, when he starts, you know, praising German and Italian fascism. A quarter of America tuned in at the height of his show to listen. So these numbers are not insignificant. Right? He's shaping the attitudes of a very large part of the population. Um, so, you know, this, this next image, I'll, I'll tell you what it is before I show it, just so you can brace this up a little bit. This is from a pro Nazi rally in Madison Square Garden. So you can see here, it happened within a couple of days of George Washington's birthday, a very deliberate attempt to fuse Americanism with this, this Nazi symbolism. It was attended by 20,000 people. And it positioned itself as That's true Americanism. So this is what was swirling around American society in February of 1939. And in May of 1939, we have what is really one of the more heartbreaking incidents in the American story. So this is a ship called the St. Louis that was full of uh, refugees, some from various parts of Europe, right? Um, but all fleeing because they knew that Europe was no longer safe for them. Uh, the ship tried to dock in Havana. Cuba at the time had absorbed 2,500 Jewish immigrants already and they said, no, there's no way we're opening our doors. So the ship passed by Miami. People on the ship could see the lights of Miami and were not permitted to dock. So people have questioned, why didn't the Roosevelt administration do anything? Um, the Roosevelt administration basically took a, a decision not to intervene, even though there were, you know, Roosevelt was the first American president to appoint Jewish people high up in his administration. But even with their input, he says, I cannot risk stoking anti-immigrant ire right now. Make of that decision what you will, but that was their rationale. Um, and then a, over a quarter, you know, roughly a third of the people on that ship ended up dying in the Holocaust later on. Yes? If I remember correctly from the readings I've done, Congress was very opposed to our getting involved in the war. I mean, this, this is 39, so Hitler's already moving. Congress was very opposed to our any kind of intervention. And Churchill and England were begging us to help. Probably closer to the war, and Roosevelt would do nothing because Congress wouldn't, wouldn't support him. 
So what the comp just pointed out is that Congress is very set against intervention, which is true. And so Roosevelt's making a political con uh, uh, calculus along those lines. Yes? Well, if Congress would have been against it because the American people were also against it, then there's a lot of anti Semitism, a lot of isolationism. Everyone politically was in a tough place. So the, the comment um, just emphasized the fact that Congress was against it because the American people were against it. So th it, it really kind of put people who wanted a different outcome in, in a political bind. Um, all that's true. And behind the scenes, Roosevelt's already setting the stage for America, joining the war, but doing this very cautiously because the nation, many, many people in the nation wanted nothing to do with it. Which is where we end up with this figure of Reinhold Niebuhr. Um, kind of a fascinating and idiosyncratic figure for all sorts of reasons. Starts out as a pastor in Detroit in the 1920s. And is very much, you know, in the social gospel school where he basically believes, you know, faith is an engine for transforming society for the better. Right? Get people in your pews, teach them how to be good people cultivate their consciences, and you can transform society. Pastoring in Detroit disabused him of that view quite quickly um, because he ran up against these race and class issues in the city. He had you know, some standoffs with, with Henry Ford. Um, he was part of an interracial commission that um, investigated things such as police violence against black people. It's not new. But he started watching these dynamics and tried to get his congregation to engage socially and he couldn't do it and the reason this was a conundrum for him is that he looked at his congregation and said you know what they are really good people right their lives are squeaky clean but i cannot get them to care about anything outside of their orbit or anything that goes against their economic interests so this pushed him to reassess um basically his whole project his whole calling as a minister um, really push him into the field of social ethics. And the basic insight that he came up with is there's something in human nature that's pretty broken. He drew quite heavily on the notion of original sin and explored the political implications of it. Um, he says quite famously, political, uh, original sin is the one doctrine that every page of human history attests to. Um, but from that pessimistic start of saying, okay, there's something in human nature that doesn't work right. There's, there's, there's this, this bent to the way that we do things that, that becomes politically problematic really quickly. And we're really stubborn about protecting our group interests. From there, he does build, to build this more, more hopeful vision and this account for why democracy as a system actually works quite well, uniquely well, with, the, you know, with these elements of human nature. Um, so some of these titles, depending on what your background is, may or may not be familiar to you. Moral Man and Immoral Society is this cornerstone in um, Christian social ethics. It basically helped launch the field of Christian social ethics in America. Um, the Children of Light and the Children of Darkness, which I will get to in a second, um, this is the book that he wrote while the war was still going on, where he makes his case for why America needed to keep democracy again. We forget this was not a foregone conclusion that America was going to emerge democratic from the war, even in victory. Um, and finally, he was a staunch interventionist from the start for a lot of reasons. Um, he's a German-American, so I, he was especially sensitive about politics in Germany, and he worked closely with Jewish colleagues, so he is really sensitive to the plight of Jews early on. So he was speaking out about what was happening to the Jewish community as early as 1933. So this is early. Um, and making the case for intervention basically by saying, guess what, we are interconnected whether we want to be or not. We are obligated to one another whether we want to be or not. And sometimes we are forced to make choices between the lesser of two evils, and there are times in history where the lesser of that evil is war. So this is not rah, rah, go America. This is a very somber case. For war, but he made this case at one university chapel after another, you know, all up and down the eastern seaboard um, throughout the 1930s going into the early 40s.
So this is just a quick clip from the PBS documentary that um, I got to consult for. Um, and in this clip, we'll get a sense of how he's thinking about human nature and connecting it to politics. American-born Reinhold Niebuhr is about to take the national stage with a groundbreaking work that brings together his theology, his Detroit experience, the harsh realities of the Great Depression, and the rise of new social orders. The book is called Moral Man and Immoral Society. It remains the most important text in Christian ethics to this day. Individual men may be moral in the sense that they are able to consider interests other than their own, capable on occasion of preferring the advantage of others to their own. But all these achievements are more difficult, if not impossible, for human societies and social groups. One of the things he thought was the greatest foundation of sinfulness was pride, self-ego, and, and uh, absence of, uh, of consideration of your own fallibilities and own potential for mistakes. And, and he drew a distinction, with, too, between the, the uh, I'd say relative purity of, uh, of a Christian life, on the one hand, by individuals, and, and how an entire community, or a larger community, even a church congregation, couldn't measure up to that high standard. At the time the book was published, varieties of liberal theology were highly influential. And the common denominator of these liberal theologies tended to downplay the tragic dimensions of the human condition, the ways in which all of us are in some sense shot through with greed and envy and resentment, what Christian theologians traditionally would call sin. Niebuhr comes in with this tragic sensibility, Augustinian sensibility, it says no, we all are fallen, we all are finite, we all are fallible. There will never be a utopian society in human history. There'll never be paradise in space and time. That we all are corrupt in terms of the choices that we make, so it's not in any way just a matter of good on the one side, evil on the other. The good and evil is shut through our souls as a civil war taking place in the battlefields of our hearts each and every one of us, no matter what color, gender, sexual orientation, civilization. So it's going to be very much about power. It's going to be very much about conflict. And the best we can do as human beings is to generate democratic possibilities. Democracy, he says, is a proximate solution to insolvable problems. Okay, so that's a very quick sprint through Niebuhr on human nature. Um, I'm happy to, well, we can discuss further in the, the Q&A, what he, you know, the, the, it's announced how he connected his view of human nature to the political. But, um, you know, Cornel West is quite helpful there in saying, he basically concluded, democracy is the best we can do. It's a broken system, it's a frustrating system, it's an anxiety-inducing system, but it's the best humans can do and we have to protect it. Um, and this relatively somber take on democracy um, landed him on the cover of Time's 25th anniversary edition. And again, context matters here, right? This is from 1948. This is an era in which America has emerged victorious. Um, and Henry Luce is the editor of Time Magazine is thinking, okay, what do we need to do to consolidate democracy in America and America's role in the world in 1948? And he saw resources for doing that in the figure of Niebuhr. Um, and so he has this moment where he's really shaping the way that people are thinking about the post-World War II era, the early Cold War era, um, and thinking very carefully, okay, how do we think about not just American domestic politics, but foreign policy as well? Okay, what does it mean to be on this stage making very difficult at times gut-wrenching calls about 
when to intervene or not intervene. Um, when do you carry, you know, when, when do you get the confrontation with the Soviets, when do you hold back? Right, so all these sorts of difficult conclusions that went with the period. So I want to spend the remainder of our time talking about this book that he wrote in 1944 for, called The Children of Light and the Children of Darkness, and draw attention to that subtitle, A Vindication of Democracy and a Critique of Its Traditional Defense. It's basically a book of political philosophy. And one of the things that he does in the book is he takes democratic theories from previous generations to task with having too rosy an understanding of human nature and how it works. And basically saying, we, we, democracy is valuable for all sorts of reasons, but it's actually because it helps us navigate the worst of us. Not only because it elicits oh, the best of us. Um, so again, 1944, this is before the war's end, right? The Pacific theater in particular is still very active while the was writing it. And again, he's just cycling through this argument based off of this you know, particular assessment of human nature. And I do want to be clear, you know, when Neighbors talking about original sin, he also is saying, no, humans are capable of amazing things. Zero question. They're also capable of awful, awful things. Zero question. So the question about what form of government you adopt is how do we mitigate the bad? We're not gonna get rid of it, but we can mitigate it and create opportunities to amplify the potential for good. And for him, democracy was the answer. Um, his work in The Children of Light and The Children of Darkness helped lay conceptual groundwork for vital center liberalism that emerged in the early Cold War era. Um, and helped shore up American confidence, right? It had a theory of how democracy could operate after we had seen really ugly aspects of humanity over the course of two world wars. So this is a lengthy quote, but I think it's important, so I'll give you all just a little bit to sit with it. I have not sought to elaborate the religious and theological convictions upon which the political philosophies of the following pages rests. It will be apparent, however, that they are informed by the belief that a Christian view of human nature is more adequate for the development of a democratic society than either the optimism with which democracy has become historically associated or the moral cynicism which inclines human communities to tyrannical political strategies. So he's trying to head off both the cynics and the optimists here. Trying to land people somewhere in the middle. And you know, the fact that he's using such robustly Christian language, um, that might seem exclusionary on its face, but the way that he wields this language, he really is trying to cast, um, cast as wide a net as he can, where people from any background can say, okay, I might not buy the concept of original sin, but, this is a useful observation about how humans operate. I, I might not believe in God, but this account of politics seems to resonate. So he's casting that net with a pluralistic audience in mind. So this is one of the more famous quotes from this book. Man's capacity for justice makes democracy possible. Man's inclination toward injustice makes democracy necessary. And this is where we start seeing the more ecumenical aspects of his vision start to come through. Because Niebuhr did not think that us as individuals or even our communities really had insight to our own dysfunctions. And we know this just from experience, right? If we really kind of want to know how to be better people, we need to ask other people. Right? What do you see in me? What, can, what do I do well? What do I not do well? What can I improve on? He thought the same was true of human communities. Right? Your particular neighborhood, your particular social class, your particular church. If you want to do better, you need the outside view to get clarity on how to do that work better. 
And so for him, if we're serious about working toward justice, we need to welcome that outside view. And for Niebuhr, that meant Christians needed to listen to non-Christians. It's the only way that you can get insight into how to be better Christians. Um, and again, he's very sensitive to power dynamics. So in an American context, which then was overwhelmingly Christian, it's still majority Christian today, where it is the religion of power, it needs to listen to groups that are on the periphery of that power structure in order to understand how to do better and how to work better with others. So here you start getting a view of how for Niebuhr uh, diversity really is a strength, not a weak weakness. It's a feature of the American um, approach to democracy. So this is the quote that Cornel West ended on. Right? Democracy is a method for finding proximate solutions to insoluble problems. It's a system of government for fallible beings that are never going to get it right. But we can negotiate and tussle in ways and work things out in ways that lead us to something a little bit better. And that, for Niebuhr, was enough. So in wrapping up here, just some basic bullet points, some major claims that he makes in this book that I think are worth paying attention to in our instructor for a moment. So the title, Children of the Light and the Children of the Darkness, he's riffing off of a parable that Jesus told where the verse says, the children of darkness have been wiser in their generation than the children of light. And so Niebuhr uses this to say, democracy has been built by foolish children of light. They mean well, but they've ignored the shadow side. And that's a problem. And if you want to learn about the shadow side, take a lesson from the children of darkness. Do not absorb their malice. Do not buy into their agendas but they have unique insight into the shadow side of human nature. And if you pay attention, you will learn something about your own shadow side as well and how to work more productively with it. Now to the more positive features of his argument for democracy. You know, this first bullet point is important for Niebuhr. It simultaneously meets the fundamental human need for both freedom and order. Other systems of government default to order over freedom. And Niebuhr makes it quite clear, humans need both. Why do they need both? Because they're spiritual beings. There's always something about humans that transcends the historical moment. And precisely for that reason, they need freedom to express that transcendence. So how do you give people both of those things? You use checks and balances. That gives you that happy medium where there's enough order to keep society running, but there's also enough freedom where the full range of the human spirit can express itself. And checks and balances are also this tool for mitigating the worst in us, right? As convinced as we are that we are right, when we run up against those checks, sometimes the people checking us have a point. And it also forces power to diffuse, right? So that it doesn't end up too consolidated in the hand of one person. Because for Niebuhr, it's a truism, right? This connects back to his view of human nature and his understanding of original sin. Power corrupts, full stop. Do not be surprised by corruption in Washington. Power corrupts. Do not be surprised at corruption at the pinnacle of business empires. Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts, corrupts absolutely. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. So this, a system of checks and balances provides ways of checking that power and thus minimizing the damage that that corruption can do. And finally, he wants to make this case that if we're going to have democracy in the modern era, we're going to have to have a high threshold for anxiety. 
because it's really hard not to get our way. It's really hard, especially when as a body politic we're processing some things that are extremely problematic and we want to fix them right now. But we're going to have to learn to sit with that anxiety if we want democracy to work. And if we can learn to sit with it, we can get one step closer to what he calls the impossible, impossible possibility of world community. Is it, will we ever actualize that perfectly? No. Do we have to work toward it? Absolutely. We have no other choice. And continuing to take steps toward it is an act of faith. So how does this refract into our current moment? You know, I, I think y'all can connect a lot of the dots, but I do want to just bullet point a couple of things for us. Democracy's been on the brink before. Um, as somebody who knows the history of the era, it was worse then than it is now. I still think that. So we've been through this before we've come out on the other side. We need to apply that lesson, right? To be honest with ourselves about our own naivete. To be honest with ourselves about our own complacency. We got too comfortable. And to find within us the will to fight, to preserve what we have. I think y'all understand I mean that metaphorically. <laughs> um, but it's worth fighting for. It's worth fighting for. And if we want to do it well, pay attention to the children of darkness. They understand how human nature works. That's why they've accumulated so much power. What can they teach us about human nature? What can they teach us about ourselves? How can we hedge against them gaining that power? These are important questions to be asking ourselves today. Democracy is a math problem. How do you get to a majority? To do that, you're going to have to make alliances with people you don't particularly like, whose agendas you don't particularly care for. But if democracy is worth fighting for, it's also worth making problematic allies over. So we need to get better culturally at drawing the distinction between moral compromise and political compromise. They're different things. What is that distinction? And where can we create space where we can compromise politically without compromising morally? And how can we work to disabuse ourselves of the idea that they're one and the same thing, because they're not. Democracy is an anxious system of government. Again, nobody gets everything they want. Nobody even comes close. That's hard on us. But if we can learn to sit with the anxiety of negotiating and the frustrations of not getting what we want when we want it, we can start to inch towards something better. This is another place where the religious element comes in. And I hope it's clear here I'm talking about this as like a religious impulse, not connected to any particular tradition. We need to learn how to have faith in one another and to take the risk of placing that faith in one another. Again, it's hard. But it's part of the work of keeping our republic. So I want to close again with this quote from Andrew Burnaby. What Burnaby intended as a word of caution just might be our superpower. As hard and unwieldy as diversity can be to manage, if we can learn to work with it, we just might get through our current era of crisis and help bring the impossible possibility 
a world community a step closer. Thank you very much. All right, so now we just transition to the Q&A. Um, any elements of this that you want to discuss, any points that you want to clarify, any comments or questions, the floor is open. Yes? Are we looking at another civil war? So the question is, are we looking at another civil war? Oh, Lord, I hope not. Um, I don't think so. But I understand why people worry about it. Um, and I could be wrong. But I, um, maybe this is where our complacency kind of works in our favor a little bit. I still think we're too comfortable to actually get to the point of, of, of live war. Um, and again, I hope I'm right. Yes? Okay, so the point is, you know, I, I made the case earlier that it was worse before, or, you know, I made the case that it was worse than now, and the commenter saying, actually, you look at an institution like the Supreme Court, it's more compromised than it's ever been. When one of the systems of governments goes, right, what happens then? Um, so, you're... I agree with your point that it's important not to overdraw the parallel with the past. There are features of our moment that are unique. And something like the current configuration of the Supreme Court is fairly unique. I will say we have had periods before um, with unscrupulous justices. This isn't the first time we've been down that path. Um, but there are certain features of our moment where you could make the case that the system of checks and balances is imbalanced in a way that's fairly unique in our history and that that does tie in with the social media age where we still haven't adjusted to this new information ecosystem and what it means to have a democracy within it. Um, could that destabilize things? Yeah, it's, it's, a, big it's a big destabilizing factor. Um, again, I, I still think that we need to kind of sit with the anxiety of it and keep pushing through. And I still think we'll muddle our way through to getting better checks and balances. Um, but it's, it's, it's going to be a white knuckle ride to get there, I think. Yes? I just have a comment on that question. Um, I, know, I know we're all upset about the Supreme Court and what's come out about the just, a couple of justices maybe doing things that aren't so ethical and also of the decisions that are coming out of the Supreme Court, but this is not new. I mean, we all think of the Warren Court and what happened in the Supreme Court during our lifetime. I mean, think of, if you go back in history, there were plenty of times when there was a majority one way and a minority the other way, and it was all very controversial, and people were very upset with the Supreme Court. So please don't compare the Supreme Court just to what you remember when you were young, and they were making this other kinds of decisions. I think, I think this, as you sort of have said, I mean, the, the Civil War, I mean, all of those periods in our history, the isolationism, um, there have been some very uh, divided periods in our history, the Civil Rights Movement, um, Vietnam. <laughs> I mean, I lived through a lot of that, and believe me, it was worse. I mean, there were soldiers shooting students at Kent State. I mean, we've been through worse. I mean, it happened. I've come out the other side. Um, so all those things, we all thought this was the end of the world, but I think we can make it through having a couple of justices on the Supreme Court for a long time. My question is this, uh, that's my speech. Um, I wish you would comment based on the, on the beginning of your talk, which I enjoyed very much. Um, what's going on now in the Middle East and the conflating of Israel as a political entity with the fact that it's a Jewish state and has a lot of large Jewish population. Because what to me seems to have happened is that even in this country, people have conflated being opposed to what Israel as a government is doing to with anti-Semitism. Um, and it's very troubling to me. 
and it looks like some of the, you know, some of the conflating of politics and religion that we addressed only in your talk, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts about that. Okay, so just to clarify, I do a quick recap from up front for the benefit of the audience that's live streaming. So like, if I miss key details of your comments or your question, please let me know. Okay. But the basic gist of it, um, if I remember correctly, is you know, we can be upset about current scandals in the Supreme Court, finding out that certain justices are compromised, et cetera. Um, but there have been moments of compromise in the Supreme Court before. Um, again, you know, it's, it's, I think it's very natural for us to kind of use our experience of growing up as a baseline for how things are. So it can feel on the basis of that experience that we're you know, in this uniquely bad moment. But if we take a historical perspective, maybe it's not so uniquely bad. You also reference the fact that you know, when we talk about the Vietnam era and students actually being shot and killed at Kent State by troops, right? We, we've been through really rough patches before. In living, in living memory, we don't have to go back all the way to the, the Great Depression to find those moments. Um, but the question was, you know, what do we make about the current conflict in the Middle East and the way that Jewishness is conflated with support for the state of Israel? Um, and you know, how I could comment on that in light of Niebuhr. So here is where I want to be really careful taking a Niebuhrian perspective on it because he was strongly supportive of the formation of a Jewish state coming out of the era of the Holocaust. Right, so he put his weight and prestige behind his formation. He testified to Congress and all of that. Um, that said, I think he would be very troubled by the conflation of you know, Jewish identity with the state of Israel. Um, we don't have this expectation for other groups. Right? We don't expect Irish Americans to align with the politics of Ireland. Right? They're American. Um, and I think we owe it the exact same courtesy to Jewish Americans. They're Americans who have their own complex ties to the state of Israel. Um, and so we need to be willing to create that balance. And Niebuhr, again, was so sensitive as a thinker to power dynamics. Israel today is a nuclear power um, that's overwhelmingly more powerful than Gaza. Um, can they avenge the attack? Yeah. I think you would say an attack that kills thousands of your people you can avenge, but you can't use it as a pretext for killing people at a 30 to 1 ratio, many of whom are civilians. I don't think Niebuhr would. I, 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 I feel pretty certain that he'd be very critical of that. Uh, so again, the truism that power corrupts. Um, the state of Israel is not exempt from that. That's just what it means to be human. And as it's accumulated power, it has become more and more, and more vulnerable to that kind of corruption. Um, so we have to hold ourselves as a nation accountable for how we misuse power, which we do all the time, um, and have to be willing to call out our allies when they do the same. I don't, you know, like you said, you've got to do that. 
absolutely not true. My friends who are on the opposite side of me, we are friends and we talk. And for me, the bottom line is, you know, the good side. Everybody wants the same things for the country, for individuals. It's how get there that you know, where they differ. And um, but I just think they're afraid. I think the justices are afraid to stand up for the Constitution. I think that the Congress are afraid of Trump and what he has on them and whether or not he'll come after them because I think he will. And he does already in the election. So, um, so for the first time in my own university, I'm afraid for the country for those reasons. And I don't know if I'm missing something. Maybe they are compromising. I think that what Johnson did on the one big vote, but that was to save this seat, to save this, this chairmanship, or his you know, speakership. Uh, so the commenter disclosed that she was a student at State and so has seen these shifts and experienced them in particularly close proximity. Um, and also commenting like at, at how previous points of crisis has felt overwhelmed and emotional but not necessarily afraid, but that has shifted. In part, because so many people in positions of power seem afraid to take a stand on anything. So that's what's engendering that sense of fear, right? Is the fact that so many people are afraid um, and, you know, I think it's, it's a fair critique. That's a funny thing about power. It, um, it can make us tyrants, it can also make us cowards. We get very protective of whatever piece of turf we have. And um, it has been disheartening to see people in elected office who hold a lot of power kowtow because they're afraid of losing a little piece of it. Um, you know, and it, it, it calls to, you know, find the, the verse, you know, what profit what profit made a person to gain the whole world and lose their soul? Would you say that again? What profit made a person to gain the whole world yet lose their soul? Mm -hmm. Yes. I want to thank you for the talk. I thought it was wonderful. I drive up here from Croton, Illinois, in New York. Every once in a while, there is a wonderful talk like this. And I hear a point of view that I think is so interesting. I also attend something similar in New York City called the Social Forum. Complete opposite. Everything that we worry about here, they worry about what we what we're stay for here. And I remember once one of the speakers said we have to have a discussion. I don't think people really want to have a discussion unless it comes down to, I want you to agree with me. Anything else is dangerous, and I'm afraid for the country. It was mentioned here that just now, the fear for what's going on with the country. At the Soho Forum, what you fear, they think is good, and vice versa. <coughs> Democracy, I think, can be in danger because we're so intolerant towards each other. So the, the speaker was just making the observation that they you know, attended this forum, enjoyed the forum, but they've also attended another forum that represents almost a polar opposite perspective of the social forum. And uh, what we view as troubling and scary, they view as good, and what we view as good, they would view as troubling and scary and how people claim they want to have a conversation, but do they really? Um, you know, one of the things that I try to emphasize as a teacher is uh, to learn to savor the art of disagreement. It's actually really gratifying to be able to pinpoint exactly where, what you disagree with someone else on. Because if you can say what you disagree on, you've listened to one another. Right, you've done some work to get there. And you, you can find that you actually end up becoming, like building relationships with people who disagree with that way. Um, I think part of what's going on in our current moment is that we are parts of echo chambers. There's zero question. Like there, there's 
we have to be, because of the way social media and the algorithms work, we get this curated feed of news that completely takes out the other side. We have to be really deliberate about having the conversations with people who think differently. Um, and doing so starts to help us realize that we are in our own echo chambers. None of us are exactly in the echo chamber. We're all in it. And we all have to do the work of stepping out of it. Um, so how do we do that? I think of it as a muscle um, that we need to, to work actively. And I, you know, I, I'd encourage us to think, you know, what does that look like um, in our communities? How do we work that muscle? How do we learn to reach out and start having those conversations? Because we might actually begin to form tenuous um, lines of agreement that way. Um, so those sorts of conversations are helpful. Um, I mean, I will say that I, I still subscribe to the idea that there is kind of a moral structure in the universe and there is right and wrong. And I do think that there are some things being complicated that, on the other side that are actively just wrong and dangerous. Um, but I welcome the conversation. I don't have to have that conversation and I hope we all figure out how to have that conversation as well. Have you ever noticed when you speak to someone who doesn't agree when you're done, they still don't agree with that? I don't think I've ever changed anyone's mind by first by its strong feelings on something. That so the point the speaker makes is like you know how many times we get into these conversations where we don't change other people's minds. That's true. That happens a lot. Um, I think we need to think of uh, changing minds as a very slow process. It takes multiple touches, um, and you can still not actually change minds, but still be shaped by that interaction, right? If nothing else, that person's impression of the other side can be changed. If nothing else, they start seeing a human being behind the viewpoint and not just like some sort of, you know, straw man that gets painted on their particular, um, you know, side of, of, of the, the ideological spectrum. Um, so there's still value even if you're not getting your mind changed. And, uh, you know, just kind of work to the wise of these conversations. Start with something peripheral. Don't go for the jugular. Right? It, no, seriously, weak arguments are more effective than strong ones. Change people's minds. You start with something small where it doesn't feel personal, we're a lot more likely to have productive conversations, and I think it's a good tool for this moment. You know, find a smaller peripheral thing that you can disagree with on safely, and that can open doors to um, potentially you know, broader conversations and, and change their minds. Yeah, that, that So the commenter gave the example of a, a, a friend who's Pentecostal shares a very different, has a very different worldview from hers. The topic of abortion came up and reframed that topic to talk about whose role it is to make the decision. And just that slight reframing opened up a much more productive conversation where they were able to find um, some common agreement. So that, that, that's a good example, right? Figure out a way to get out the, the hottest button, the hot button issue. Find some cooler buttons. And that can, can open doors. Because at the other end, I guess, listen, we're, we're, we're all, you know, we're all kind of insecure and 
anxious and, and just trying to like figure this out. And if we give each other space and let each other off the hook a little bit, it can go a long way. And 